I know what you're after. You marry for money. Stop saying such nonsense. It's obvious, isn't it? Someone like you, a poor single mother. That's why, even after your husband is gone, you continue to stay. You are really an eyesore every day. I, Mia, 35 years old, am on the receiving end of such snide remarks from Emma. My father passed away when I was very young, and I was raised in a single-parent family. Thankfully, my mom kept working even after she got married, so we weren't exactly destitute, but we certainly weren't wealthy. Still, my mom was always cheerful and she worked hard for me. Because of this, I never felt particularly lonely growing up. I planned to start working after graduating from high school. My mom, however, had been diligently saving up for my college education. I loved studying and I really wanted to go to college, but I couldn't bear to burden my mom, who had struggled to raise me with this desire. More than anything, I wanted to ease her burdens, so I gave up on the idea of going to college right from the start. So when my mom suggested that I go to college, I was overjoyed. My mom got married when she was 23 and she had me when she was 25. When I was in my third year of high school, my 43-year-old mom, who was still very active, told me, I'm still in my early 40s and I'm very healthy, so Mia, pursue the path you like. It would hurt me far more if you gave up your future because of financial concerns, Mom. I felt tears welling up at my mom's kindness and strength. I took on a part-time job to help cover tuition. Thanks to that, I was able to graduate college without taking out student loans. After graduating college, I joined a large trading company. I worked hard every day because I wanted to make life easier for my mom. Within five years of joining the company, I was promoted to administrative assistant and my salary increased. I took my mom on trips and was able to buy her the massage chair she had been wanting. Two years after becoming an administrative assistant, my work was recognized and I was chosen to be an executive assistant. I got to talk a lot with the president's son, Ethan, and our relationship progressed to dating and eventually marriage. Congratulations, Mia. Be happy. Yes, thank you for everything. When I expressed my deep gratitude, my mom was moved to tears. She was incredibly happy for me, and it was a truly joyful time. However, that happiness was short-lived. Just two years into our marriage, my husband suddenly passed away. He collapsed, clutching his chest at work, and was rushed to the hospital. But by the time I arrived, he had already stopped breathing. That morning, I had watched him leave for work, tearfully saying, I'm off. I could never have imagined such a harsh reality. The shock was so great that for a while I could barely speak. It was unthinkable that both mother and daughter would lose their husbands, and I could only imagine the grief of Benjamin, the president, who had lost his only son. He looked so alone and was clearly devastated, just like me. I continued working even after I got married, and as the executive assistant, I spent a lot of time with the president, especially during the day, so I could see firsthand just how disheartened he was. However, there was one person who didn't seem to be grieving at all. That was Emma. Because we lived together after my marriage, I quickly noticed her attitude. Actually, Emma wasn't related by blood to my husband. Benjamin's real mom passed away when he was just three years old. Realizing it would be tough for a man to raise a child alone, he remarried when Benjamin started elementary school, thanks to an introduction from a friend. No, if something happens to my hubby, all this property will be mine. What are you saying? Ethan is gone. Oh, lighten up, it was just a joke. I thought a little cheer might help everyone in these gloomy times. Please think about the time and place. You must be upset that your plans fell through. Now you won't get a single cent of our man's world. I never counted on such a thing from the start. Can you expect me to believe that? There is no way you would marry a wholly wordless man like Ethan unless you were after something. 
Stop talking like that to me, he was irreplaceable. Emma seemed to think I would pack up and leave as soon as my husband passed away, but I didn't. Benjamin was acting strong at work and handling his duties just like before, but from my close observations, it was clear to me that he was pushing himself too hard. So I couldn't bear the thought of leaving the house to someone like Emma. Besides, even though it was only for two years, our home was filled with memories of my dear husband. I wanted to bask in their afterglow for a while. Feelings aren't easily severed. Indeed, the time I spent with my husband was a happy one for me. My husband once told me that Emma was more like a roommate to him than a mother. She was often out and about, and when Benjamin was away on business, she would often not come home until late at night. But my husband didn't want to worry Benjamin, who was already busy with work, so he kept quiet about it. In fact, Emma was very kind when Benjamin was around. Her sudden change was so drastic that it was as if there were two Emmas. When Benjamin went to work, Emma would see him off with a smile. I'm counting on you to look after Ethan. Of course, Ethan is a precious child to me, too. Knowing you're there for him allows me to focus on my work. Don't worry about a thing. Do your best at work. Thank you. Have a good day. But the moment the door closed behind him, Emma's smile vanished. Ah, finally he's gone. Now, where should I go today? Maybe I'll invite a friend to the movies. You're going out again? Yes, do you have a problem with that? Oh no, remember, don't bother your father with unnecessary things. He's working hard for you. If you say something, he'll worry and won't be able to concentrate on his work. You should quietly study at home every day. Okay, I understand. That was the daily routine, but apparently it didn't bother him too much once he got used to it. In fact, he felt more comfortable when he was not paid too much attention. When he was a child, he thought Emma was like a chameleon. Well, I don't really mind. I think of her as Dad's wife, not my mom. Benjamin was always grateful to Emma for coming when his child was small, allowing him to focus on his work. Benjamin's company was a legacy from his step-grandfather. Benjamin seemed to have a knack for running it. From the moment he took the helm, the company grew exponentially. Now he's managing five businesses, each pulling in an annual revenue of high $100 million. This, of course, means Benjamin is always insanely busy. My husband used to tell me that when he was a kid, Benjamin barely had time to unwind at home. Seeing Benjamin exhausted from work every day, my husband couldn't bring himself to trouble him with unnecessary issues. That's why he never mentioned Emma. Besides, he didn't feel entirely neglected, so there was no need to bother Benjamin unnecessarily. He was content keeping his concerns about Emma to himself. That's so like him, a relaxed individual. He never struck me as a typical heir to a huge company. Did you ever get angry about it? No, not really. I was okay as long as she was home. It gave Dad peace of mind knowing she was there so that he could focus on his work. Plus, we never went hungry, and there were always plenty of snacks. I see. My husband laughed it off, never making a fuss. I love that about him. Besides, it's not like they were mean to me. They just didn't fuss over me. Sure, Emma would throw some snide commands my way from time to time, but I just took it as typical mean mother-in-law banter. Plus, she was often out and about, attending theater performances, shopping, or dining with friends. Since I was still working, we didn't cross paths that much, so her sarcastic remarks didn't really bother me. If my husband didn't make an issue of it, there was no reason for me to bring it up either. However, being a thrifty person since childhood, Emma's reckless spending did bother me a bit. It felt wasteful. Nevertheless, since neither Benjamin nor my husband voiced any concerns about it, I didn't feel it was my place to chime in. I kept my thoughts to myself. But after my husband passed away, seeing Emma shopping and indulging in luxuries with a happy, 
carefree attitude left me feeling uneasy. Emma, please try to be supportive of Benjamin. Be there for him. Even though he's pretending to be okay, he's really lonely, I pleaded. Excuse me. Why on earth would I listen to you? What's your angle, huh? Trying to worm your way into our family for some of the inheritance, um. I've never even thought about that. Well, Ethan's gone now, so why don't you just leave already? I won't be leaving. Benjamin has said he's fine with me staying as long as I need to. At this, Emma shot me an irritated look but didn't say anything further. She probably felt relieved knowing she didn't have to worry about me inheriting Benjamin's wealth. But three years after my husband passed, Emma was becoming increasingly annoyed with me still being around. Her sarcastic remarks were becoming more frequent and more hurtful. After all, whether at home or the office, I'm always with Benjamin. Emma seemed to think I was buttering him up, scheming to take over his fortune. It hurt to be perceived in such a light, and I began to question myself, wondering whether it was right to stay in a house where the husband was no longer present. I could gauge Benjamin's situation at the office every day. It might be better for me to return to my single mom instead of living here and enduring Emma's sarcasm. Mom is turning 60 this year, and last year marked the third anniversary of my dad's passing. I had been contemplating my future when Benjamin collapsed. He was fortunate to survive, but there was a high possibility he would need caregiving even after discharge from the hospital. At the company, things didn't immediately fall apart when Benjamin collapsed since he had properly trained his successors. However, Emma's attitude noticeably shifted. The man got what he deserved. He has been so stingy lately. What do you mean, stingy? Our credit card limit has been decreased. Our living expenses have been cut. Is the company in trouble? I don't think that's the case, Emma. As it happens, you missed your husband's third anniversary ceremony last year due to a hangover from the previous day's wild night out revealed by the credit card bill. It seemed Benjamin, who rarely checked on Emma's spending, had investigated this time. Missing their son's third memorial was too much even for him. In his fury, Benjamin decided to limit the money Emma could use. That said, she was getting more than enough money for a normal life, so there was no need to complain. Benjamin himself said that the company might be in trouble. Eva's absence hit him hard and before he knew it, things had turned sour. Don't play dumb, you know it too. All because we lost a single son. How does that justify ruining the company? No, I truly didn't. And yet he says, despite his condition, he is going to rest at home, live a long life. He's been telling people the doctors said he could live to a hundred. That's good to hear. There's nothing good about it. If he lives that long needing care, it won't be a joke. Emma, her nostrils flaring, began to launch into a tirade about Benjamin. Hearing her call him dull and annoying left a sour taste in my mouth. Who did she think had been funding her lavish lifestyle? Even if Benjamin's company was in trouble, she could at least offer to support him, I thought. And then Emma said something even more unthinkable. So I have decided to divorce him. Pardon. Just think about it. The company might be in danger. What if we end up in debt? It's only wise to get the property settled and leave before the money runs out. Are you planning to abandon Benjamin when he needs help? I can't handle a bedridden old man with no money left. I'm going to take what I can before his will is gone and say goodbye. Is that so? Emma's words, said as if she had come up with a brilliant plan, brought up a feeling of disgust in me. However, just a week after having that conversation, Benjamin's condition drastically deteriorated and he passed away all too quickly. He's gone too just three years after my husband passed. Everything seemed to go dark. 
Benjamin's voice was so similar to my husband's. Sometimes when we talked, it felt like I was talking to my husband. Not being able to talk to him, not being able to hear his voice anymore, it was too much to bear. Oh no, that man has gone to the afterlife. What perfect timing. He still had assets left, right? His company didn't collapse yet. Maybe he died before taking on debt for my sake. This means all remaining ounces to remind how fantastic, Emma, you sound pleased even though Benjamin has just passed away. Oh, you noticed. Too bad for you, though. You're not getting any inheritance. I would have preferred Benjamin to be alive than any inheritance. Don't give me that high-minded talk. Now you're just pretending to be tough, trying to impress everyone, aren't you? Even if you asked, there isn't a single cent to give you. Despite Benjamin's death, it seemed like all Emma could think about was money. How could she be so heartless? Thinking of that, I felt sorry for Benjamin, which only added to my grief. So you don't have to come to the funeral. What? Strangers are not allowed at the funeral. I see, that's how it is. Emma didn't seem to understand reality, but I didn't feel the need to explain it to her. Are you sure about that? Of course. Now that he's gone, I, his wife, am in charge. Understood. So, two days later, Benjamin's funeral was held quietly, with only close relatives respecting his wishes not to have a grand company funeral. After the funeral, I saw a bunch of missed calls from Emma on my phone, but I didn't return them. Emma tried to reach me many times afterward, but I completely ignored her. Then one day she suddenly showed up at my workplace. I finally got you. What are you thinking? You're not answering my calls. Oh, uh, Emma, what can I do for you? Still messing around. I was kicked out of the funeral home. You were the one who should have been left out. I called you so many times on the day. What's the meaning of this, huh? Well, you're not with my mother-in-law anymore, Emma. What? Well, you said that strangers are not allowed at the funeral, so we had a family-only funeral. And then I asked Emma, who's now a stranger, to refrain from attending. You are the stranger. No, no, the stranger here is Emma. What? When Benjamin fell ill and was told he would be bedridden, Emma had served him with divorce papers. Emma seemed to think that because Benjamin was hospitalized, he had gone to heaven without submitting those divorce papers. But those divorce papers, I had submitted them as Benjamin asked me to. So Emma is a stranger to us in name and reality. Back then, Benjamin had shared a lot with me. It seems he told Emma that the company was in danger, that he might end up in debt. If that happened, they couldn't live the life they had been living. From then on, it would be a modest life for just the two of them, and so on. He thought that if Emma was willing to support him through that, they could continue as a couple. But at his words, Emma frowned and coldly responded, that it's probably better to split before you're burdened with debt. Benjamin collapsed one month after that conversation with Emma. Even after he woke up, he knew his health was not good, but he hid it and told Emma that he was in such a state that he would have to let go of the company and he would probably have to rely on her for care. As expected, Emma then proposed a divorce. She probably wanted to divorce before he was burdened with death and get some money through property division. But Benjamin, who had realized his limited time left, had already donated most of his personal assets, except the house, to children's and animal shelters and volunteer groups, and he had already appointed talented subordinates as presidents of his companies and transferred all the shares. So there was almost no property left to give to Emma. When he told her this, the color drained from Emma's face. So, I don't get anything. Well, strictly speaking, it's not exactly zero. I did leave a few hundred dollars in savings. A few hundred dollars? That's hardly enough. 
Even though Benjamin had told me this beforehand, hearing it from my mouth, I could see how thorough Benjamin was. He must not have wanted to split any property with Emma. Maybe it was Emma's attitude when her husband passed that pushed Benjamin to be this resolute. But there is the house. If I sell that. Oh, yes, uh, please move out of that house as soon as possible. I'm staying with Mom for now, but I plan to move back eventually. What are you saying? You're a complete stranger. You have even less right than I do. As I said earlier, the stranger here is you, Emma, who is already divorced. Also, the house was originally inherited by Benjamin from his grandfather, so it doesn't count for property division during divorce. So why do you have the right to live in that house? Because when I got married, Benjamin and I adopted each other. What? So I have the right to inherit Benjamin's property. Benjamin left me that house. Hardly believable, isn't it? The idea of adopting me had come from Benjamin himself. When we got married, I didn't think about it much at the time. I was going to be marrying his son, and in his eyes, that made me his daughter. So I went along with that option. But when my husband passed away, I kept quiet about this. I was afraid that if I mentioned it, Emma would think that I was after the family fortune. So I have work to do. Could you please leave? I asked Emma. If you need to communicate anything, please do so through our lawyers. I have sought the advice of our company's legal counsel. I called security and had them escort Emma out of the company premises. I made it clear that she was not allowed to step foot in the company again. Emma put up a fierce resistance, but when I threatened to call the police, she quietly left. She attempted to contact me numerous times after that, but I ignored her completely. Her relentless efforts to make a claim on our fortune only resulted in a barrage of complaints to our lawyer. Our company was far from going under, and Emma couldn't understand why. She argued that if it was bankrupt, there should be wealth to share. But the company had already been handed over to a successor before Benjamin's passing, and it was no longer in his possession. Therefore, there was nothing left for Emma to claim. As for the family's real estate properties, they had already been settled in the divorce before Benjamin's death. The lawyer patiently explained that Emma had no right to any of it. Our lawyer, somewhat exasperated, confided that Emma had been quite persistent. Emma, who had been under the impression that she was entitled to a share of the will, had recklessly racked up debt on her credit card. Now she was stuck paying it off, working multiple part-time jobs from morning till night. However, her financial woes were not my concern. Emma was ten years younger than Benjamin. They had married when she was twenty-five, and now she was fifty-five. They had been married for almost thirty years, which meant that Emma was entitled to survivor benefits from the Social Security taxes Benjamin had paid even after their divorce. However, she would only be eligible for these benefits when she turned sixty, which was still five years away. Furthermore, she needed to have filed a claim for a division of the pension within two years of the divorce. I wasn't sure if Emma was aware of this, nor did I have any intention of enlightening her. I had no sympathy or obligation to worry about Emma's well-being. So here I am now, living in the home I once shared with my mom, Benjamin, and my husband. My days pass calmly and peacefully. There are moments when I remember my husband and Benjamin's smiles, and I can't help but shed tears. But remembering their warm smiles, I too want to live each day with a smile on my face.